y'all welcome back to my channel my name is Evelyn and today I wanted to wish you all a very happy Latinx heritage month so I guess maybe I should say hola y'all or like hola mi amigos as you can tell my Spanish is very limited but I'm learning <laughs> This week I'm going to be talking about some of my favorite books by Latinx authors and then next week I'm going to be talking about books by Latinx authors releasing in the next year or so that I am very highly anticipating reading. So I am incapable of like ranking these books. I love all of them very much and so I'm just going to be talking about them in the order in which I read them approximately. So that means we'll be starting with Labyrinth Lost and the rest of the Brooklyn Brewhouse trilogy by Zoraida Cordova. Alex Mortiz does not fit in with her magical family. While her sisters Lula and Rose are perfectly comfortable using their magic, Alex is terrified of her bruja powers. So at her death day celebration she performs a ritual that should remove them for good. However, she ends up trapping her entire family in the magical realm of Los Lagos instead. Now it's up to Alex to navigate the deadly landscape of Los Lagos with the help of an untrustworthy brujo named Nova and her non-magical best friend Rishi to rescue them. So this book is equal parts urban fantasy and portal fantasy in a way that's super intriguing. I loved the world building. The bruja brujo community in Brooklyn felt super real and interesting and I wanted to explore even more of that which is why I was so excited when I learned that there are two other books in this series each following one of the other Mortiz sisters. So the second book, Bruja Born, follows Lula who has healing powers and then the third book releases soon and it follows Rose and it is called Wayward Witch and I believe there is another portal fantasy sort of element to that one as well. This was the first book that I can remember reading with characters that were explicitly Latinx characters who spoke Spanish on the page and also the first book I remember reading with a bisexual main character. And so it holds a really special place in my heart for both of those reasons. And I am very, very excited to be returning to the world of Brooklyn Brujas very soon when Wayward Witch releases on the day that I have forgotten. Wait, LOL, I thought it released in October, but apparently it released in September. So like, I can read this. I've dropped the ball. Oh no. Next we have Don't Date Rosa Santos by Nina Moreno. This book follows Rosa Santos who lives in Port Coro, Florida with her Cuban immigrant grandmother. And it's said that the Santos women are cursed so that any man who falls in love with them is destined to die at sea. And so Rosa has been told her entire life to avoid the water and also to avoid boys with boats which is about to become a whole lot harder because the town is banding together to try to save the marina by putting on this festival and Rose has volunteered to help plan a wedding as part of it and of course she's being helped by a boy named Alex who happens to be very attractive, very sweet, and also owns a boat. I love this book because it's the first one I've read that really centered specifically around Latinx diaspora experiences. So Rosa is two generations removed from her Cuban culture. So although she has grown up in a community where there are a lot of Latinx people there, she's never visited Cuba and feels like her grandmother's the real connection to that culture, that she does not have her own really solid claim. And in fact, she would love to go back to Cuba and has been looking at study abroad programs in Cuba, 
but she's afraid to bring it up with her grandmother because there is a lot of like trauma there. That really resonated with me. I am a third generation Mexican American. My great grandfather immigrated from Mexico and over the years my family has lost a lot of the culture. I just recently even found out where in Mexico he was born, like where our family was from. We didn't know that. Um, we weren't taught the language, which is why I'm currently having to take Spanish classes to learn how to speak Spanish. Um, in fact, the only thing that we really have connecting us to the culture um, explicitly is the fact that my grandma has all of the recipes that her father taught her uh, from a very young age, and so my mom and I have been trying to learn those. You saw in one of my previous videos, I did a reading vlog for Miss Meteor, which is another book I'm about to talk about in this video, and I made tortillas from scratch. Because a lot of that culture is rooted in my grandmother, the woman has all these recipes memorized, right? We try and write them down, but like, she doesn't even know. She's like, she just feels the ingredients, right? And so a lot of that culture is rooted in her and her experiences. And once she's gone, um, it'll be a lot harder to hold on to. And so I really definitely related to that aspect of Rosa's story. It's also just a really adorable romance and like you just need to read it. I am getting emotional thinking about it. I've read it three times. I've sobbed every single time. So if you have not picked it up yet, please do. It is such just a burst of sunshine. It's such a good story. I love it so much. Next, we're going to talk about Library of Lost Things by Laura Taylor Naimi. This book follows Darcy, a teenage girl who finds solace from the chaos of her life within the pages of books. See, Darcy's mother is a hoarder, and she has been counting down the days until her 18th birthday because it means she will no longer have to live with the fear that someone will discover her mother's hoarding and then take her away from her mother. There's a new building manager who keeps asking if he can come look at their apartment to talk about upgrades. Her best friend's older brother who's been helping them with maintenance for the past few years is about to move away and Darcy does not know what she's going to do. To top it all off, she has met this guy and she's starting to have feelings for him, but how does she even let him in when for the longest time letting new people in has meant risking everything. So uh, some things I love about this book, first of all Darcy and I cope with our emotions in very similar ways. We both escape into the world of literature. So reading about a character who does that was very lovely but at the same time I feel like the book sort of called me out because Sometimes that escapism is not the most healthy thing in the world, so <laughs> thanks for that. I also really loved the romance in this book, specifically because the love interest has his own issues. There are lots of YA books where it feels like the love interest only exists to be the love interest for the protagonist and does not have their own problems outside of their relationship with the protagonist. This is not the case in this book at all, which I absolutely loved. And also, they flirt at a bookshop, like, like a lot. Next we have Ghost Squad by Clarabel A. Ortega. Best friends Lucille and Sid have accidentally awakened some malicious spirits that are wreaking havoc throughout St. Augustine. They'll have to team up with Sid's witch grandmother Babette, a magical cat named Chunk, and the firefly spirits of Lucille's ancestors in order to help save the town. This is the only middle grade book on this list. I picked it up because it was described as Coco meets Stranger Things with like a Ghostbusters sort of flair to it. And honestly, that is like exactly how I would describe this book. It has all of the warmth and heart of Coco, which if you do not know is my favorite movie of all time, and all of the fun 
friendship fueled hijinks of Stranger Things with like if Ghostbusters was magical. I really wish that I had had a book like Ghost Squad as a kid because it's a fantasy book, the main character is a girl, she teams up with her female best friend to be badass and fight some ghosts and that's amazing on its own. But also the characters speak Spanish on the page, they talk about their culture, and as a kid I did not have a way to talk about my Mexican culture. I knew that my family was Mexican, but it sort of felt like this special secret sort of world that was only accessed through like grandma's house, right? I didn't have a way to talk about it with my, I don't want to say generically white, but yeah, generically white classmates and friends. Like, how was I supposed to, as a kid, listening to everybody talk about how they went to their grandparents' houses over Christmas and had a big Christmas dinner with, like, ham and mashed potatoes, how was I then supposed to be like, oh yeah, we went to my grandma's and we had rice and beans and mole? Like, they're ten, none of them know what mole is. <laughs> I did eat, like, ham and mashed potatoes at my other grandma's house, so I could, like, blend into the conversation, but it was always, like, something that was in the back of my mind, like, well, does nobody else also do this other thing? Am I weird? Am I different? And, you know, kids don't want to be weird and different. And I didn't look the part, so I didn't feel comfortable talking to the few kids that I did actually know were Mexican in my elementary school because they were all people of color as well. And I didn't feel like I would fit in with them because they were more Mexican than me. So it was just sort of a thing that was a fact but not something that I knew how to engage with. The representation in Ghost Squad isn't even Mexican. I think a lot of people have made that misassumption because of the Coco like comparison. It's actually Dominican representation. However, I still think it would have meant a lot to me because it at least would have been a reference point. And so I am so happy that it exists now for other kids maybe in this similar situation to me who are now going to have that thing to point to, to be like, oh look, that character's like me. And also to be able to show other people who aren't like them, to be like, look, here's this part of me and it's beautiful. and it's so celebrated in those pages. Next we have In the Dream House by Carmen and Maria Machado. This is a memoir that actually deals with Machado's experiences in an abusive same-sex relationship through the lens of several different genres. So I read this after having been introduced to a few of Machado's short stories for classes last year and I was absolutely in love with her writing and this book just blew my mind because it deals with such an intense subject in such a beautiful way but also because she is a freaking genre chameleon. Like structurally I've never read a single thing from her that was not like completely different than everything else she's done but they all share this sort of just I don't know, magic to them. It's, it's super difficult to explain, but this book in particular, each chapter, each section in the book um, is dream house as blank. And then the chapter is themed around the style that she's chosen. So for example, one of the coolest parts of the book is dream house as choose your own adventure. And in the center of the book, she has a choose your own adventure style section. Um, and that's so cool. But at the same time, despite this like distancing from the situation via these genres, it's also very emotionally raw and real. And it's touching on a subject that does not get talked about a lot, which is abuse within same sex relationships particularly between women. So not only is it beautiful, but it's also deeply, deeply important. But if you're not 
a huge nonfiction fan or if that seems like it's a little intense for you, she has short stories published like across the literary world. She also has a collection of short stories called um, Her Body and Other Parties, which I have not read yet, but I really need to. And so if that's more aligned with your reading taste, I think you should check those out too. Everything she writes is amazing. I, I love her work so much. And I met her, she came to Iowa City last year to do a reading and she was really, really sweet and nice to all of us dorky college kids, so. Next we have La Bizona by Romina Garber. As an undocumented immigrant, Manuela Azul has spent her life hiding, both from her father's Argentine crime family and ICE. Her entire life fits within the confines of a small Miami apartment. But in one fell swoop, Manu's life falls apart when her surrogate grandmother is attacked, her mother is arrested, and lifelong secrets begin to unsurface. Manu discovers a secret world straight out of Argentine folklore that is somehow connected to her father's past. She begins to learn the truth about her heritage in this strange world where daughters are born brujas and sons are born as lobizon, aka werewolves. Manu should fit right in with her unusual sunburst eyes, but the more of the story she uncovers, the more it seems like her entire existence might be illegal. Okay, the camera died, so I moved you over here. We were talking about La Bizona. So, this book is once again bridging the gap between urban fantasy and portal fantasy in a really fun way. I don't know what it is about Latinx authors being right there in the middle of those two genres and doing it fabulously, but I love it, love it very much. There are many, many things that I love about this book. First of all, found family trope. I love the found family trope and this book does it amazingly. There's also LGBT representation in this book. Because the society that they are in is very strict about gender roles, there's a lot of discussion of that and how gender roles can be harmful, which is like amazing. There's discussion of menstruation, which does not happen enough in YA in my opinion, because a lot of these books have heroines who should be dealing with their period on top of saving the world. But that's just my thoughts on that. Um, and that's a soapbox I don't actually need to get on to today. See what else? Oh, there's a magical sport that I actually could understand and like follow and like it was really cool. Um, the magic is like elemental based, but like in a really unique way. Oh my gosh, I could keep going on and on. There is like a, there's a portal fantasy element to it and the world that they go into is really cool and I really hope we explore it more in book two. Oh, it's a series, so there's going to be even more. And it's the only book I've read with werewolves where I actually liked how the werewolves were portrayed. And once again, Manu's a character who does find a lot of solace within the pages of books and so that was really fun to read. I always love reading about characters who love reading. Is that self-indulgent of me? Probably. Next we're talking about Each of Us a Desert by Mark Oshiro. So she is a quintista. It is her job to take the stories of her home of Empalme and give them to Soli to protect her people from Los Pesadillas? sins that manifest as living nightmares. You know, I looked up how to say all the Spanish words earlier and then they're gone. They're gone. Brain does not work. I'm very sorry. But when Zoe receives a story warning of an imminent threat to the town, she decides to keep it, which is definitely against the rules. <laughs> not wanting to forget that danger is near. Another Quintista has come to Empalme, one who uses his abilities in unnatural ways in order to seize power. Questioning everything she has ever known about her own abilities, Sochi embarks on a journey across a nightmare-filled desert with a girl she can barely trust as her guide. So this is the first book that I actually have a physical copy of it with me, except it's an ARC because I got this for a reading vlog that I did earlier this year on my channel, so I will link to that somewhere and you should check it out because I was very proud of that video actually. But this book, this book is so amazing. It's beautifully written. There is a sapphic love story to it and also the setting just comes to life 
in a way that is both beautiful and also really creepy. If you are interested in how theology interacts with fantasy, I think you will really enjoy this book. It's got a lot of elements of like religious trauma that probably went a little bit over my head because I was raised without religion, but were very fascinating to read about anyway. But yes, this is just such a beautifully written story and the ending made me cry and also I have a playlist for it <laughs> that I did as part of the reading vlog so if you're thinking of picking it up please check out the playlist because I think it might set the mood for you maybe just a little bit. Next we have Miss Meteor by Taylor K. Mejia and Anna Marie McLemore. This is another arc because I did another reading vlog. You can check that one out as well if you want to watch me cry over how amazing this book is. Like literally, like cry. In the 50 year history of the Miss Meteor beauty pageant, no winner has ever looked like Lita Perez or Chiqui Quintanilla. In order to make pageant history, these two former best friends must team up with Chiki's beauty queen sisters in order to transform quirky wallflower Lita into the perfect contestant. But at the same time, both girls are keeping secrets. Chiki is grappling with her pansexuality, feeling as if she comes out she will officially be way too weird for the small town that they live in. And Lita is literally made of stardust. And if they don't win the pageant, she might actually have to return to the space where she came from. Like I said, this book literally made me cry. Not only does it have Mexican-American representation, but it has multi-gender attraction representation. Cheeky right here is pansexual. And uh, if you want to hear all of my thoughts on that, go check out that reading vlog. But... <laughs> This book just burrowed its way into my heart. It's another found family story. It's funny, it's emotional, it's a little bit magical. I just love it so much and I really want other people to read it so we can like gush about Cole together because Cole's my favorite. And then we have one honorable mention because I have not finished reading this book yet, but I am already in love with it based on the chunk that I have read, and that is Cemetery Boys by Aiden Thomas. This follows Adriel, who is a transgender brujo, except his very traditional Latinx family doesn't actually believe that he's going to be able to master his brujo powers, so they have not let him participate in the rites of passage that he needs to unlock them. So he and his cousin Maritza take things into their own hands and do the rites in secret. Now to prove that he is in fact a real brujo, he'll have to summon a ghost and then help it pass on. He does this ritual thinking that he's going to summon the ghost of his mysteriously dead cousin to help figure out what happened to him, but he ends up summoning the resident bad boy from his school, a ghost who absolutely refuses to leave until they help him figure out his unfinished business. So that's as far as I've gotten. That's all I know. That's all I know about the book, and I am already in love with it. It is the first fiction book by a transgender author with a transgender main character to hit the New York Times bestseller list. I helped out with that. I pre-ordered this copy and I didn't start it until like a few days ago because I am so bad at keeping up with my TBR but I'm already loving it. It is the perfect book for spooky season. So far it has not been too creepy for my wimpy ass self to enjoy. And yeah, I will definitely keep y'all updated, but I felt comfortable saying that you should read it simply because of how much I've already loved the opening few chapters. There you have it. Those are my favorite Latinx books by Latinx authors. I'm going to be posting a video next week talking about books by Latinx authors that are releasing in the next year or so that I am highly anticipating. There are some books by authors that I talked about in this video. There are books by authors I've never read before. 
Uh, so I'm just, I'm very excited for that video. Keep an eye out. That'll be coming up next Monday. That is all that I have for y'all today. Remember, if you liked this video, to click that subscribe button so you can keep getting more bookish content from yours truly. Also consider checking out my blog, Here There Be Magic Writes, where I post things like wrap-ups and bookish playlists, and I just keep all of the bookish fun going over there every Fantastic Friday. Hopefully starting up again this Friday. So with that being said, my name is Evelyn. I make new videos every magical Monday and I'll see you real soon. Bye-bye.